Uh, my name is Elena, and I'm Boston based entrepreneur and expert in education. My last project, Premier in Education, is focused on uh, students helping to develop themselves for education, and we're looking at more like a life term journey and we work uh, with kids like information for them. And some of our students are over 50 years old. So we take it very seriously. Uh, one of our strategies is actually helping our students to get into colleges. Uh, we, we focus mostly on uh, United States um, admissions. And today um, I'll try to share with you my experience, my expertise as a student in the United States. I have my bachelor's degree there, I have my master's at MIT there. I've been living there for many years and been working with students for over six years right now. So I'll try to uh, share as much as possible. The structure is going to be this. Um, this um, I will have, I'll talk about 15 to 20 minutes about things which I think matters most. And by those, I mean, uh, how do you actually find your university? Um, and then how do you finance your education in the United States, which is right now extremely expensive. And then uh, we move to a session about how do you actually send out of hundreds of applicants for applying to talk place, because if we talk right now about top universities, the competition is really fierce and we can have about 100 people actually competing for one step. Which doesn't mean doesn't make it impossible people get in, but you really need to understand how to do it. So let's go to the next slide. I Jim, think Jim, I kind Jim, of Jim. I'm the gender, but uh, let me ask you a question. So since you're here, I assume that American education somehow interests you. Can you tell me why? Yes, because uh, I've seen that this can be. Uh, successful people coming from American universities, mm -hmm. and I believe that they are in English, obviously, in the United States, helps a lot, uh, both because yeah, yeah. everyone yeah. is yeah. at this point, it's uh -huh. easier for us to study there, yeah. and uh, they generally have a very high reputation and uh, status. Right. So, it's status and network kind of thing. Anyone else has any ideas why would you even care about Education. Uh, I'd say networking. Networking. Uh, <laughs> to be quite honest, it's more about networking. Okay, how about next slide? Well, I definitely agree with you. Uh, international network is definitely one of the most prominent and important things about uh, US universities. It's true, if you look at our famous politicians or business people, majority of them are trading over 80% of the Forbes list. But, um, presidents of living countries, they come from US education, I mean, from US universities. But network is actually just one of the wonderful things about uh, American universities. Uh, one a very important part, in my opinion, in addition to network, is actually uh, flexibility of American education. I don't mean that. For example, uh, when I wanted to study in, in the United States, I really wanted to pursue a career in fine arts. My parents was really against it because apparently as an artist, it would be really hard for me to make a living. So they suggested me to do computer science. I said, like, forget about it. No computer science. Don't even think about it. We agreed that maybe actually economics will be a middle ground. But what is wonderful about the United States education that you can do both. So I did major in economics with a minor in art history. And it's just one of the examples. You can, for example, major in finance with a, a concentration and <clears throat> applied math, right? You can do interdisciplinary study uh, where you study technology, science, and society. So you can, first of all, you can mix a lot of things. Another thing is if you're really not sure what you can do, and I'm not saying it's true for you, but maybe it's true for your friends uh, or I know, your network, a lot of people, don't know what exactly what they want to do when they go to university. They stick to something what they think might be very practical for them, but then they stuck with something they really feel passionate about. So actually, in many of United States universities, you can apply with undecided major. So undecided major, you say like, I haven't decided yet what I'm gonna do. And I have 
sometimes it's a year, sometimes it's about two years. When you can figure out, you can what you want to pursue as a profession. So it's extremely flexible thing, and it's very uh, for the United States. Another thing which is extremely, I think, special about the uh, United States education is campus life. Right, uh, majority of universities would require you to live on campus, like a real adult life. Uh, it's a very different experience from uh, many universities, for example, in Europe. So campus experience uh, where you're having like when you live a, as a grown up, you build relationships that are last for lifetime. This is also a very part, a important part of um, American university's culture. Another thing which is also extremely important, very practical, and um, used to be very American focused, but less so those days, is a um, project oriented studies, which means when you, for example, study physics or mathematics, you just don't do it through the books and then doing just a lot of problem solving, but you apply a lot of experience. And for example, majority. <clears throat> Of, uh, was, of professors at MIT, uh, even then they were teaching us statistics, they had an industry experience, for example. My professor of statistics uh, was consulting American airlines for many years, and then we were studying statistics, we were going, going for real case studies, which is extremely helpful. So those are things which I think are making American universities are very special. So let's see what we, else is there. <laughs> so I think we can start. So uh, it's maybe a little bit of a scary slide in terms of how much information it has on it. Uh, but I think it gives you a good uh, understanding of, of how diverse is uh, American education landscape and how much it has to offer. It's much more than just the names that you have, such as Princeton, Harvard, Stanford your MIT, which would uh, fall under private universities. Uh, under public state uh, universities, when we start, um, say public, we usually think about um, public as uh, state-run. So for example, universities of Massachusetts, right? We have four universities of Massachusetts with different campuses. There is always a main campus, uh, which is called flagship campus, and usually has a better facility, attracts more elite students. It's true for majority of public run universities, except for California, which has exceptionally high quality of public universities. Um, they have six public universities, and those six fall under top 40 in the country. And public could, uh, could be really, really strong, like University of Michigan, extremely strong. I'm sure you have mine in Berkeley, uh, right? So UCLA, those are actually public universities. Uh, what else uh, we should take out of this picture? Well, I want you to be aware that there are actually over 4,000 of universities in the United States, which is a lot, out of which really, I would say, you should really look at like around 150, 100. What is very important about um, US universities, like for example, we have see here on the private Institute of Technology, uh, Institute of Technology, uh, right? And I think the picture majority of people would have in Europe, in Greece, uh, Romania, as in, in Europe, for example, and even outside of Europe. Then someone speaks about uh, Polytechnic University, the picture is the studying just science there. That's not how it works. They try to make you a well rounded person. I mean, uh, and even if you start at most perfect, for example, you still have to take some writing uh, class, you still have to take some public speaking classes. Same thing would uh, run true for MIT. Like when you apply during, I mean, when you study for the first year, you have to take a second language, you need to take uh, writing courses, creative writing, you need to take public speaking. I had a really fun example of one of my students here. Yeah winner of Olympiad in computer science. When I asked him, what is your favorite course at MIT? He told me, it's actually public speaking. I find it <laughs> comfortable speaking in public. Because when we start working together, and before he was applying um, to MIT, uh, basically, no matter what kind of question you ask him, he usually would give you two answers, yes or no. It's, it was very hard to manage to uh, organize the question in a different way. So the reason I brought this slide, when you think about um, American education landscape, don't think about just brand names. 
uh, try to research what universities are taught under your specialty, which is also very important. And also remember, which many people don't know, that each of American university runs like its own country. The rules can be very different, even in terms of application process. For example, some universities may say we require uh, SA, um, test taken. Some may say, oh, you, we require two recommendations. Others may can say three. Some say we don't look at the recommendations. If you decide to apply to American University, you have to assume that each university are looking, you're looking at might have its own rules. So be very careful when you look at the specific. So given there is so much information, oh, one thing I also wanted to manage um, to mention is, I don't know how many of you uh, heard term SLAC, small liberal arts colleges. Have you ever heard about such term? Okay. No. Those are places which are um, uh, really um, not well known outside of the United States, yet they provide Top quality undergraduate education. They don't have they don't have a graduate degree. They purely focus on undergraduate body. And when it says liberal arts colleges, it doesn't mean they, for example, don't have a computer science. It all it means those are small institutions. They focus purely on undergraduate admission. And sometimes the quality there as good as Harvard. And they are selected, for example, in Amherst College. If I'm not sure you ever heard of or not. But Amherst College is actually except 4% of uh, applicants, which is same as Harvard. Mm -hmm. Those are actually um, quite, uh, some of them are more general in terms of financial aid for international applicants, which I think is important for you. The reason why, because they're not so known outside of the United States, but in terms of um, opportunities, and especially if, for example, you want to get a graduate degree and then you want to go to a graduate uh, school after, uh, top SLAP actually are feeders into graduate programs. So like Princeton, Yale take most of uh, their students out of those places. Once again, not known outside of the United States, but in a very important country. So what do we have there? Okay, so <clears throat> what those are, they think, I think uh, you should basically think of uh, when you are picking your universities. The reason why I want to um, really focus your attention on this because majority of people, when they apply to the United States, what they think is brand and network, brand and network, which is definitely important. But if you get into top university, let's say, Harvard once again, right? But it really does not have maybe the program you're looking for. Highly unlikely, but there are things that a lot of universities are doing better than Harvard, right? And for example, if what are your like educational priorities out of Harvard, what even you want to graduate out of Harvard, and what was personally important to me is culture of a university because Harvard on leadership. And it's actually, in terms of, it's a really, really competitive place. It doesn't mean it's bad, or it, it just is very different. But if you go to MIT, it's very different in terms of a spirit. It's more uh, oriented on teamwork. It's very free in a spirit, more creative. Once again, doesn't mean worse or better. It just means it's important when you look uh, at university, Go to a website of university, look at what alums are saying about seniors, not just the, you know, a main page, oh, this is our mission, yeah, this is great. I mean, no, and I'm not saying mission is not important. Mission is very important, but look what alums are saying about this university. Look what kind of projects are people participating. Do you want to be a part of this student body? Because those are the people you're going to spend four years of your life, or maybe three if you graduate faster. But it's a long period, and uh, you will most probably stay friends with them for a really, really long time. And uh, in other two slides, I actually, um, before you uh, press <laughs> the uh, button, um, one thing is how um, when you look at uh, the ranking, don't look at the general ranking, look at your specialty ranking. It's some uh, ranking, uh, it's, uh, it's something very uh, it's not a simple problem. We're not going to be able to cover it right now. But a general advices 
look at the specialty. It's a little bit skewed because it still shows um, standing for graduate school, but still gives you a better idea what a specific university would be given. Here is a, give you a specific example. How many people of you heard of Babson? What is it, right? <laughs> well, you will be surprised. Uh, press the next yes. slide. Uh, so this is actually a number one university in the United States in terms of entrepreneurship. Okay. How many of you are planning uh, uh, applying there? I mean, I'm not saying you're interested in entrepreneurship, but be for it. This is a school many people outside of the United States never heard of. It's a really number one entrepreneurship school in the country. There is a trick to it. You might ask me why not MIT or not Stanford. There is an answer. It's uh, Babson is actually number one entrepreneurship, what is called lifestyle entrepreneurship. It must, it's not technology entrepreneurship. So it's a little bit different. But still, the truth is it produces a very successful entrepreneurs. Another college, uh, hold on, don't, how many of you heard about Harry Ma? <laughs> okay, let's look at Harry Ma. Uh, so this is actually the second in the country uh, high and paying place after MIT. In terms of selectivity, it's as basically as good. It's amazing for someone who really wants to go for engineering. I'm not saying you want to go into engineering, but I don't know what majors you're planning to pursue, but I would, did, I would, if I were you and would ever consider applying to the United States, I would, did, I would do a really good research in terms of what are the places are really, that are really good on what you want to concentrate on. Okay, now how we're actually gonna be able to, uh, next slide, I think we're gonna talk about finance, yeah. So important uh, point about, how are you gonna <laughs> be able to afford all this uh, wonderful life? And I think uh, in the um, majority of cases, it's extremely uh, expensive, right? Uh, not even the question of getting in, uh, but being able to afford it. Uh, for international students, uh, there are two types of um, financial aid, is need-based and merit-based. Let's go uh, to explain what need uh, based. So there are need based scholarship are uh, the ones that provided by um, uh, by private universities only, and um, they have a concept of need blind and need aware. What does it mean need blind? Need blind is that university is only looking at you as a person, as a candidate. They don't really care. Can you afford this? Uh, or you cannot afford it. It's only about you. Those are need blind universities. Then there are need away universities, which will look at your application. They will look if you can afford it or not afford. And then they kind of make this mixed decision about if they want to accept. Next slide. Unfortunately, right now, uh, there are quite a few universities in the United States. This is not the complete list. This is the list uh, that shows um, the most famous places I mean, you most probably heard of. But those are the universities that will look at you as you. You apply there, if they want you, they make sure they give you money. Well, I think that kind of uh, most information I wanted to share with you. Here's, uh, since the idea of this uh, workshop was uh, you know, talk a lot about how you can actually differentiate yourself. Uh, if you decide to apply, uh, I will ask my colleague Julia Bar, right now located in the United States, and is an our expert, is our director of academics, um, education. Uh, she's expert in, in essay writing. She is actually herself a graduate of Middlebury College, which is one of the uh, flat. Um, colleges in the United States, and then she got the degree from the University of Chicago. But Julia will talk about personal statements and essays in general, in the sense, in the sense of how can you um, um, stand out of all the people who are in the crowd, let's say this way, and make yourself um, make help. She will talk about how you can create your story. Because uh, when you apply, most of the people who apply, they have really high grades, right? Uh, they have 
college degrees. Some of them have international awards. Some of them are elite sportsmen. But what helps you to get in is actually creating your unique story when uh, admission committee reads about it and they understand this is someone who would fit well in our college. This is someone we want to have in our student body. And also this is someone uh, who wants graduate will be successful alum because at the end of the day, the university are very pragmatic, right? They're looking for successful alums. Well, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to let Julia uh, to join. Okay? Yes. Thank Julia, you. can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. And can you hear me? Yes, we can quite hear you. Can you guys hear her? Yes, everything works fine. And um, am I, is my screen showing up? Yes. Okay, terrific. So how many of you have even looked at the personal statement? What it consists of? And yeah? Okay, how many of you find it quite scary? Okay, yes, I can see the room. All right, so what I wanted to talk about today is how this becomes a really important part of standing out. In the main kind of evaluation of your application, they're going to look at your grades, your test scores, your accomplishments, your recommendations, and then for a lot of you, there will be a general sense of yes, we want this person, but they feel that way about more people than they can actually let in to, to make the class size that they want. So the personal statement is really important in terms of that kind of second level of evaluation, where it's not just a yes, we want you, no, we don't, but we want you more than these other 50, 100 people who have the same accomplishments, the same grades. Do any of you have ideas on a personal statement, either the, the our Zoom participants or anyone in the audience? Do any of you have so many ideas that you don't know which one to choose? Not so much. Maybe we're more at the stage of just trying to figure that out. Um, okay, so what is the personal statement supposed to do other than making you stand out uh, above the crowd, right? There are kind of multiple approaches to a right answer to this, but what I would say is that it really only has to do two things. It has to make the admissions committee feel like they got to know you from your file and make them feel like you're a person they'd want to get to know even better on their campus for four years. So on the flip side, then, there are only two ways that it can go wrong. It can not help them get to know you or it can help them get to know you, but not make them feel like you're someone they want to get to know even better. So in a 650 word essay, so we're talking about basically a page, how do we accomplish all this? These are really just the things I've picked from my experience um, that I would recommend thinking about in this task. Um, so being memorable, fitting in with the rest of your application. What do, what do I mean by be positive? I'm gonna give you a chance to discuss this in small groups in just a second. Um, why and how would you show personal development in 650 words? Self-awareness, what, what might that mean? So at this time, we're going to do a, our sort of interactive part of our session. And I would like for you to get in groups of three, introduce yourselves a little bit um, and share where you are in the process. Maybe share a little bit about your goals in applying to US for education, if this is something you think you would wanna do. And 
pick two or three of these points, not all of them, and discuss what I might mean by that. Because I'm going to come back and tell you what I mean, but I would also be very interested to hear your thoughts on what what this is all about. Um, so maybe on site, we could break into two groups of three. And then on Zoom, I am going to, there we go create breakout rooms. We will regroup in kind of 10 to 12 minutes. We'll see if we've had time to discuss and then we'll share a little bit about what you came up with. Any it's questions? So you can <laughs> like another Yeah, I think everything is clear. Great. So now online participants, you see on your screen an invitation to go into a breakout room. Please join those and be sure to discuss what you want to do with your application. Uh, we have uh -huh. discussed, we have prioritized uh, to be memorable, play to our strengths and show development out of these uh, points. And some things new, some new insights for me were that uh, apart from being like, uh, apart from being uh, memorable, uh, showing my strengths, it's also uh, essential to be positive and uh, like-minded with the students that you start uh, that you study with. Mm -hmm. Right, giving a sense of that's a a great point. You're giving a sense of not only who you are in your own brain, but who you are as part of a community is a really important thing you can do with the personal statement. Thank you. Let's have. Okay, great. Yes, go ahead. I see a hand raised. All good. Uh, in our group, we would like to uh, additional point of being uh, showing sort of a vulnerability in your essay as it demonstrates uh, for admissions that you're not only like academic machine, uh, but you're a real human being that you also undergo for certain difficulties on your life path. And what is more important, showing how you're overcoming those challenges. So uh, it shows that you're able to overcome and become a better version of yourself. Great. And I think that plays in really well with the showing development and self-awareness. Because someone who doesn't have vulnerabilities that they're aware of I, hasn't developed very much and isn't self-aware. So that's a great point too. Um, one, one or two more, maybe from the room. Okay, yeah. yeah, maybe come here so it's more clear. That's Finally. good. <laughs> uh, we chose uh, the three of us from the Greek team. We thought that for us the most difficult ones were to be memorable and to show development. Now, I would personally mention my uh, the fact that I really like to help my friends and any people from my environment to be better at school. I know a lot of people who are not uh, doing that well, and I love to help them see them improve. And even though from the many competitions I've been, I meet a lot of people who are also very high in academics. And I really like talking to them, sharing our ideas and being on the same level. But it makes me much more happy to actually see others who are not as able to develop further. It makes me feel like 
going to university, getting more knowledge would make me even better at that. So that's the main thing that I would mention personally. Not sure. That's great. And I actually like the way that fits in with complementing the rest of your application, because if you're someone who looks like an obvious high achiever, academics are maybe pretty easy for you, then the fact that you value achievement and academics is part of you, but then you could use the personal statement to show how you care about those things for others and not just yourself. Yeah. Um, any final, and anyone? Have, will... No, we have one more person at least, Julia. Great. Cool. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, uh, we discussed in our team how, um, first of all, it's important to be memorable so that when they are deciding on whether to accept you or not. Uh, no, no, go on. Speak. You're here. It's they good. They actually remember you for what you've written instead of just your name and your surname. Uh, and we also discussed how there's a fine line uh, that you have to walk between showing, like so showing your strengths and just coming across as arrogant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that can work in with complementing the rest of your application and also showing self-awareness for sure. Do we have a couple more? Or, okay. So Hello, before you move on, uh, I will. I just want to offer you guys to move here because I think uh, while I'm moving, I think he, there you can barely hear Julia. Or mm -hmm. the sound is fine. That is not fine. Okay, yeah. okay. If if it's fine, so, sorry. Continue, Julia. Great. Okay. Examples of how to be memorable, unique, compelling. Right. Some people might have a major story in their lives. Right. They you know, overcame a disability. They have a startup that's removing plastics from the ocean or bringing art education to rural women, something like this. But something to make your story unique and compelling and memorable can also be something more about the narrative or about how you describe your story. So for example, you know, we once had a student who had survived thyroid cancer and you know, we he helped her like realize that this image in her head of the thyroid um, looking like a butterfly, because that was that was really something that stuck in her memory from this experience of seeing the, the medical images that she could use that image of a butterfly to talk about surviving cancer, but also about how she transformed in the sense of, you know, butterfly, caterpillar to butterfly. Another student, um, for example, was an open water swimmer um, and did competitions in the sea, uh, but he also wanted to spend his future working out um, ways to, in finance, work out ways to uh, use water more effectively in agriculture in his country. So those are just little sort of hooks that help an admissions committee remember, ah, the butterfly girl, the water guy, right? So because they read so many of these, um, you can think creatively about how to make yourself memorable, not just through your story, but also through your writing. Remember, they have your resume and this personal statement is there to let them get to know you beyond your top 10 activities that they're going to see in your, in your application and your top five accomplishments. So if you already have, you know, a lot of competitive activities on your activity section and some medals and accomplishments, in your accomplishments section, uh, you want to use the personal statement to go a bit beyond that, you know, not just write about that time you won the gold medal. At the same time, you want to strike a tone that's consistent with your resume, right? So for example, someone whose activities are all about uh, 
you know, abstract art or poetry or something like this, it, it's going to be weird if your personal statement is like, let me acquaint you with my top five goals, right? Because they're just sort of different kinds of, of person or different kinds of activity. So you want to mesh with the person who's presented in your application, but not just repeat the things in your application. Do we have any questions so far on be memorable and complement your application? Great. So being positive, this is pr actually probably the most kind of technical in a literary sense part of the personal statement because you personal statements to be self-aware and show development, as we've said, they can't be just happy sunshine, you know, butterflies and daisies, right? There has to be some sense of grappling with a difficult world. But at the same time, Americans are quite positive people and they want a sense of optimism. So you really need to think critically about how you present the challenges that you've been through. So a story about financial hardship or bullying or even persecution or experiencing war, these things can work really well depending on where in the story you put the elements that feel negative and difficult and how you describe them. So for example, again, from, from my experience, we had a student who ended up starting an NGO that was actually about bringing art education to rural women. That was a real life example. And in her first draft, the whole first half of the essay was about the horrible bullying she experienced to the point where that kind of ran away with the essay. And it was just this sort of victimhood story. So what she did was she rewrote it to start the essay with her success and how she ended up creating this NGO. Then she sort of went through the background of how she developed to the point where she did this and then ended up again in the present with this very positive outlook. So working in that story of bullying was totally valid and good. It just has to be thought through where and how it's going to go. Again, admissions committees love reading about overcoming hardship, but they also want to read a story that leaves them feeling like the world is like there's optimism, like the world is a good place. On the sentence level, so how would it be different to read? right? The sentence I just said, what if I said admissions committees really don't want to read a story, leaving them feeling like the world is a terrible place? What would it be like if this slide were called avoid being negative, right? Do you feel that difference where even though I'm actually saying the same thing, I'm framing it positively instead of negatively? People often have a tendency to um, think in terms of how not to get it wrong instead of how to get it right. And that comes out even just in individual sentences. So thinking about how you express your story, being positive matters there, as well as thinking about the story on the, on the whole and how you're telling it. Any questions? I see the how can I learn to write properly? <laughs> we'll we'll come to that in, in, a, in a little bit. Questions? Getting it wrong, the questions. <laughs> no, we don't have any questions right now. Great. Okay. As you're doing all this introspection, it can be easy to forget that admissions committees are actually even more interested in the person you will be when you graduate. So who you are going to be in five, 10, 20 years is really more important to them than the person you are right this moment. So as a writer on the narrative level, showing that you have developed so far in life 
it affects the reader's perception, right? If you've shown that you're on a trajectory of change, it really helps a reader see that you're someone who's going to continue to change and develop at their university and as an alum of their university. And that is, is really important. That's the kind of person they want to be admitting, not someone who already knows it all at 18. So read the room when it comes to sensitive issues. The world is, is a difficult place in some ways right now, and you need to be aware of kind of where, where you fall in the general scheme of things. There will be people, there will be people who, you know, took the SAT the morning after they had to um, go bail their parent out of jail um, due to lifelong mental illness, right? There will be people who have survived war. There, will, there are people applying to American universities who have real severe difficulties in their lives that they've overcome. So again, this is a takeoff on a real experience that, that we've seen in an essay. It, writing about kind of, you know, it was really hard for me to be, you know, whatever, my, have an Italian background because on my dance team, everyone thinks the French girls are prettier. But that, that's just not, that's showing a lack of self-awareness that the admissions committees are gonna, gonna pick up on. Um, another thing that's very important to think through thoroughly is writing about any sort of volunteering, maybe that's brought you into, into contact with people who live really underprivileged lives, especially in the context of any travel or cross-cultural setting. These can be great stories, but you have to do the work of self-examination to really understand where you fit into this story and have a very advanced understanding of the social and economic issues in play when you write about things like this. So for example, I went to the Caribbean on my vacation and I witnessed extreme poverty. Now I wanna go work in international development. So I'm gonna solve that. that that might be a, a true story for a lot of people, but it's a tricky narrative to make work in a personal statement without having really thought through and worked through not just the issues of what you witnessed, but who you are, what your background is, where you fit into the world. This is just sort of a final tip when picking the story you will tell you want to choose something that plays to your strengths as a writer. So if, for example, you know, you're not that comfortable with your English um, or you have great English, but you aren't really, you know, you're, you're not much of a literary person, picking a story that's going to require you to do kind of detailed sensory descriptions might not be the way to go. You might want to go for a story that's much more straightforward and requires a kind of language that you have faith in yourself to write. And that goes for everybody. Uh, someone who finds it very difficult to write kind of short goal-oriented statements might want to come up with more of a of a storytelling rather than a kind of statement of goals kind of personal statement as well. Does does that make sense to everybody? Because these are kind of our our core tips on the personal statement. I also want to invite you if you're interested in having a longer workshop with us or or doing more work on this, please um, use this code and we're very happy to talk to you. But I also wanna just collect from the Zoom participants and the participants in the room, what are your final thoughts? What's something important that you learned today or questions for us? We are here, yes. I saw a hand go up, I think. There was a hand with the phone scanner. Yeah, uh, by the way, uh, one thing about the code I would like to say is that 
even if you're not interested in continuing this conversation, I would really appreciate you scanning this form and giving us feedback what you found useful and what you didn't find so useful because we were doing it mostly to be helpful. So for the future, we can make our observations, how we would change it or keep it the same, but I would really like to uh, hear your feedback on that. I would really appreciate that. Uh, Julia, thank you so much. And <clears throat> one more uh, thing I want to share. I, I, I think Julia, in my opinion, Julia <laughs> gave you really a good overview of, of, of what you need to focus on. It might sound overwhelming a little bit, and it's actually a lot of work. So if you be writing uh, in classes for American universities, allocate three to four months to write. So you write the first draft, you think about it, you show it to the friends. Like when I showed my first draft um, and my, mm, it wasn't the first statement, it was one of the essays um, to MIT. The question was, how do you define success? A, a good friend of mine looked at us um, and he said, uh, your success looks like a laundry list. <laughs> you have to <laughs> No, what I'm saying is like, uh, you, it, 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 it's a very, um, it's not an easy process, but it's actually a really reflective process. And when you do it, think about it, not just, uh, okay, what, how I need to get this uh, right and get into a top university, but think about as a process that helps you to learn more things about yourself, to think about yourself, actually become um, more, uh, uh, I wanted to use the word success, successful, but everyone defines success differently, but a better version of yourself, so to enjoy life and people around you enjoy life too. Okay. Becoming, well, it, becoming a grown-up. Is, is an <laughs> becoming a grown-up. I don't know, I'm not a grown-up, <laughs> but I'm in the process of development. Yeah, anyway. Um, um, thank you. Um, yeah. And I would another thing I would just say because that was a really great note to end on. Um, Elena was the most successful personal statement final versions are ones written by people who are okay throwing the first like four or five in the trash. Yeah. So don't get discouraged. It's not an easy process for anyone. And don't think you need to be outstanding to write outstanding personal statements. That's not the case. Yeah, uh, a I have a, a couple questions on Zoom. Can I explain the phrase show, don't tell? Yes. That's yes. because guidance counselors love to say that. And if you don't know really what it means, it can be very confusing. Um, so it's pretty simple. A statement, think in terms of evidence, right? Like an argument and evidence. When you, if you just say, um, I am a very goal-oriented person, that's trash because anyone can say that. I'm not really, and I can say that. It doesn't mean it's true. If you tell a story about yourself that actually shows that you're a person who will go through difficulty to reach their goals, then your statement has evidence proving it. And that is the core of the show don't tell. Think in terms of the evidence, not the argument. They gotta go together. How to choose a topic for a personal statement if you have no idea what will work best for you? Well, it's hard. I would start by looking at all the prompts. There's a lot of options and trying to brainstorm at least one or two things you could talk about for each of those prompts. So ending up with, even if you end up with kind of 10 or 11 ideas, you will, as you go through your brainstorming, start to be able to sort out which ones sound like you could write 650 compelling words and which ones are less so. So look at all the prompts and don't commit to a certain question early in the process. That is all the questions I have on Zoom. Thank you so much, Julie, for joining us uh, at the very early hour still in the United States. Uh, thank you for everyone who.
join us. Do determination and go back in person. And those who showed up in Zoom, I know that you had a really uh, difficult week. I'm really impressed with all of you. Um, at six o'clock um, in the lobby, if uh, some of you have personal, I mean, want to have more question answered, uh, very specific personal one from six to seven, I will be in the lobby. You can find me there with Daria, my colleague. We'll be happy to meet you. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay.